Thank you, Victoria. Thanks to the uh, Dharma Libertarian Club for inviting me. It's great to be on campus. It's always fun to be talking at universities. So, you know, the, probably the biggest mystery in the world today, in my view at least, right, of all the mysteries out there, the biggest mystery in the world today is the popularity of socialism and the unpopularity of capitalism. It is truly mind-boggling that a system that everywhere it is tried to the extent that it is tried has failed is today popular. And a system that everywhere that it is being tried to the extent that it is tr being tried is a massive success. It's unpopular. It's as if the human race is on a suicide mission to choose the worst system and to go for it, rather than to choose the best, the one that has promoted human life the most, the one that has created the highest standard of living, the highest quality of life, the highest amount of wealth of any other system in all of human history. There really is no competition, and the very, the very idea that we have to even debate this is nuts, if you know just a little bit of history. How many people were poor? I mean, really poor. What the United Nations called extreme poverty. What percentage of the world population was extremely poor 250 years ago? Pretty much everybody. 90 plus percent, right? $2 a day or less, that's how they measure it. But you could argue that 100%, because hey, they didn't have running water, no toilets, the flush, we take for granted. No electricity and no iPhone. So you're poor by definition, right, if you don't have those things. But 90 plus percent lived on $2 a day or less. Pretty much since the beginning of time, or since the beginning of the human race. So if we do a little, I could do it on the board, I guess. Oh, wow, great. I get to use, a, I get to use the chalk. I haven't done that in years. But it's a bad, it's really bad. All right. Here we go. Can you see that? This is time. This is income or wealth or per capita, any way you want to look at it, right? This is the graph of human wealth. You know, about 100,000 years ago, it starts somewhere here around $2 a day. It goes up a little bit during Greece and Rome. It goes back to $2 a day or less. And then it goes this, and it goes there, and I'd have to keep going. What is that? The inflection point where everything starts happening. When is that? Yeah, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. One way to think about it. Anybody have a date for the beginning of the Industrial Revolution? I mean, in a sense, there's no one date, but you know, it's easy if we think of one date as the beginning. It's a range. In 19th century, a little late in my thinking, right? 19th century is already, we're really into the Industrial Revolution. We're going at it. But what's the date where it all changes, where everything changes? 17, yeah, you've seen this, right? It's 1776 is my favorite date for three reasons. You guys probably think of one, but there are three. First, is it's the f it, that year is the first time the steam engine is used for commercial purpose. So in that sense, it's the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. We're industrializing. We're using an engine in business to create stuff. Second, famous book is written in 1776, or published in 1776. What's that? Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Important book in terms of the history of markets and economics. But third, and by far most importantly, is it's the year the most important political document in all of human history is written, and that is the Declaration of Independence. And it's, that document is, it, it, it's not out of nowhere. It's a combination of a whole set of ideas. And what are those ideas, what is that period before the founding of America? What, what do we call that period? The Enlightenment, the age of reason, right? This is an age in which we discover, rediscover what? The role of what in human life? The mind, reason, enlightenment, 
Enlightenment not in a mystical sense. Enlightenment in the sense of the power of reason to know reality, to know truth. It starts with Isaac Newton. It starts with the scientific revolution. And it's, it's, it's turned into a political idea with John Locke. But the idea is the same. The idea is that every individual has the capacity to understand reality, to know truth, to reason, to think for themselves. They can discover truths about the world. They're not in an ancient book, these truths. They're not in the, you know, the power of philosophy kings. They're in every individual's ability to know reality, to know truth. And people start asking these questions about, well, okay, if I can actually understand the laws of motion, as Newton has taught me, why can't I choose who to marry? Because they didn't in those days. Or why can't I choose my profession? How, who chose your profession in those days? You inherited it. Whatever you were born into, you are part of a guild. Suddenly you can make choices for yourself. And they said, wait a minute, if, if I can do all that stuff, why can't I choose who should govern? And that's ultimately the declaration. You can. And the idea that each individual has a right, what does rights mean? What do rights mean? Rights mean freedoms, freedoms of action. It means that nobody can use coercion or force against you as you pursue your life, as you pursue the values necessary for your life. You pursue the judgment of your reason. Nobody has a right to interfere because you have capacity to think for yourself. Your life is yours. It doesn't belong to the tribe, the group, the king, or anybody else. That's what the Declaration tells us based on the thinking of philosophers leading up to that. So for the first time in human history, really, there's a document that expresses the idea that as individuals, we are all free, free to pursue our values, free to pursue the conclusions of our own mind. And that unleashes a revolution, not just a political revolution in a sense that we're not politically free, or at least most of us are. The Declaration, of course, is full of the contradiction of slavery, but most of us are free. Not just that we are free politically, but suddenly it unleashes the mind. It's not an accident the Industrial Revolution follows, because suddenly entrepreneurship, I've got an idea. And for the first time in history, I don't need to ask anybody for permission. I don't need to get anybody's approval. I can just go and do it. I can try fly. I can see what electricity does. I don't have to wear goggles. I mean, imagine Thomas Edison today doing the experiments that he did. I mean, he would be thrown out right, for all the safety violations he committed. Never mind the Wright brothers trying to fly, right, without a helmet. You fly without a helmet. They just did. They went out and pursued their mind, the conclusions of their reason, and they did it without needing permission of a king, without needing permission of a church, without needing permission from an authority. All of human history, we have been, or most of human history, with the exception maybe of ancient Greece, we have been dependent on authorities to approve what we did, to tell us it's okay. And suddenly we were freed up. And we went out and we built, we created, we made, and this is the result. A massive increase in human wealth. A massive increase in income. A massive increase in life expectancy. What is life expectancy in 1776? 39 in, in, in you know, England and the United States. 39. By the end of the 19th century, by the end of the, that 100 years, it's already getting close to 60. And today, students among you, you know, you probably have a life expectancy realistically of 100. Many of you will live well into your hundreds. It's stunning, the success we've had. It's stunning how good life is and how good life has been compared to all of human history. It's not even close. And what this sparked is basically the fundamental ideas of 
a system called capitalism. Because what is capitalism? Capitalism is a word everybody throws around out there. Elizabeth Warren, by the way, claims to be an advocate of capitalism. If that's capitalism, then I, I have no idea what it means. Right? Capitalism is a system in which all the government does is protect your rights. In other words, it protects your freedom to act, your freedom to pursue your values. It protects your property rights and otherwise leaves you alone. It's a system in which all business, all property is basically owned by private individuals, not by government. That's what capitalism is. That's what the founders, without even having the word, without even having the concept, that's what the founders created. They created a system of limited government where the government basically protects your rights and leaves you alone otherwise. And all of this is a consequence of capitalism. It's a consequence of leaving people free, of not asking for permission, of not having an authority, of not controlling, dictating every human action. And if you go culture after culture after culture, country after country after country, when they adopt even a little bit of these ideas, because nobody's adopted them fully, even the United States of America never really took its own ideas seriously. Right? Again, slavery later on, all kinds of regulations and cronyism and all kinds of stuff. But to the extent that some country takes these ideas seriously, to that extent, it is successful. To the extent that it doesn't, to that extent, it is a failure. So this graph is primarily Western Europe and the United States. What happens in Asia? Well, Asia stays poor. And then it goes like that. And when's that? When's the inflection point in Asia? Well, different countries are going to be a little different, right? But approximately. 50s, you know, maybe it's a little early. 60s for South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore. Why? What is, what is unique about those countries, Asian tigers, they were called? They adopted what? Freedom, at least in the economic space. They said, in economics, in economic activity, generally, not perfectly, unfortunately, you can basically do what you want. You don't have to ask permission. You can use your mind. You can follow your values. Go do it. And they took off every single one of those countries. India, anybody you know what inflection point in India? 91, they basically took away a lot of the controls, a lot of the kind of the, the, the socialist policies that, it, that had been part of Indian economy up until that point. They were adopted by the founders of the Indian state in 48. What's the date for China? No, earlier than that. This is 1978. Mao's dead. That's a prerequisite. It is. And Deng Xiaoping comes to power, and Deng Xiaoping is a, is a pragmatist, and he says, let's see what works. Let's test stuff out. Right? I mean, he's a bad guy, responsible for Tiananmen Square, but overall, he's, he's willing to experiment. So he says, oh, the province next to uh, Hong Kong will leave you free. We won't intervene. We'll see what happens. I don't know what will happen. Hopefully, it'll become like the West. Boom, it becomes like the West. Growth. So he says, okay, let's try the same thing in Shanghai. And when he tries the same thing, same thing happens. So he starts expanding this throughout China. And there's still very, very poor areas in China, primarily those places where they haven't implemented this principle of freedom. Leave people free. And what happens is you get massive wealth creation. And we've also, so we've tried this, and we know exactly what happens. We do. And we've also tried the opposite. We've replaced the king and the tribal leader and the witch doctor and the church with a new authority. Call it the proletarian or race. Tried that under fascism. Or government just broadly. Some authority, the bureaucrat, whatever. And to the extent that we practice that, we get this. You know, the latest example is Venezuela, where they tried to restrict freedom, take away private property, 
nationalize industries. And the result was the same thing happened there that happened every other country that's ever tried that methodology. Poverty and destruction. And don't let anybody tell you that Venezuela is not, did not attempt socialism. They did. They didn't do it all the way. True, there was still some private property in Venezuela, whatever that's worth. But they, things they nationalized were agriculture and the whole supply chain of agriculture and oil and the whole supply chain of oil. Well, those are the places where you got complete devastation. Venezuela used to export food. Now it can't produce enough to feed itself. Venezuela used to export oil, largest oil reserves in the world, more than Saudi Arabia. And yet now they can't even produce enough oil to consume themselves, never mind export it. It's devastating. You've all seen the photographs, the satellite image, I assume, of North Korea and South Korea, right? I mean, there's the stark difference at night. North Korea is completely dark. South Korea is completely lit up. One is basically free, somewhat capitalist, a little bit, and the other has nothing. No capitalism, no freedom, no private property. And you see the contrast. After have to remind students that the Berlin Wall was not built to stop young people escaping capitalism. Because I think people today have such a negative view of capitalism, they think, yeah, we built the wall to save this, the socialists from all this, you know, immigrants from the capitalist countries. Other way around, people were fleeing communism. Just like they flee Cuba. I was debating a socialist uh, in England a few, uh, about a year ago. And uh, the moderator asked, what is the, what is the country that mo best represents your, like, your idea of what a, what a, the world would look like, right? And we both said, well, there's no countries in the world today that really, da, 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 you know, the caveats. And then I said, well, if I had to choose of all the countries, you look at the Economic Freedom Index, eh, New Zealand sounds pretty good. To start a business in New Zealand takes four hours. And the guy, the socialist guy says, Cuba. I almost fell over. You mean the country from which people are willing to swim in shark-infested waters in order to get out of? That's your ideal? I mean, okay, well, we know exactly what that means. Death and destruction. It means this. Because that's what socialism means. Everywhere, always. All right, so all of this, you can go test. You can go look in the world. You can check it out. This is all just factual data. There's no interpretation here. All you have to do is go to Havana and go to Hong Kong and look at the difference. One is communist or socialist, and the other is as close to capitalism as we've come, or at least in the 20th century we came to. One has a population of seven and a half million with skyscrapers, every modern convenience. It's an unbelievably dynamic, exciting place, and I recommend everybody visit Hong Kong before it's over. Havana is dead. They drive automobiles from the U.S. in the 1950s, not because they're all car collectors, but because they can't afford anything newer, because they're poor. There are no restaurants other than all serving the same food at basically the same price. There's nothing. In terms of human life, there's nothing. That's why they're willing to swim, to escape. And don't believe the Michael Moore myths about health care. Oh, my God. I mean, I can't imagine, uh, you know, anybody going to hospital in Havana. Anything more scary than that, than having to do that. All this is testable. All this is to me, and I think to anybody who's really willing to look at the data, willing to use their eyes, using to use their mind just a little bit, not even a lot. This is pretty self-evident. This is not hard. And you visit these places, you just see it. It's obvious. So why do we hate capitalism, which we do as a culture, and love, and are falling in love, if you will, with socialism? I mean, we might have, for the first time in American history, a socialist as the, nom the nominee of a major political party for president of the United States, which will be perfect 
because the Democrats have become socialist over time. So it's, you know, he really represents them. I mean, it's shocking that just the word socialism doesn't cause everybody to run in the other direction fast. It's an evil ideology with evil results. So what is it about capitalism that we hate so much? Because we hate capitalism. And I think it's that we hate capitalism more than we love socialism. I think we're just looking for something other than capitalism. We're looking to escape this system. I don't know why, but we are. So let's dig a little deeper into the characteristics of capitalism. Maybe we can figure out what's going on. So what's capitalism about? What are markets about? Because capitalism in this context we're going to talk about right now is we're going to talk about in terms of free markets. Markets in which people can interact freely in exchange, in trade, and in production, free of controls and regulations and people intervening. What, what, are, what are people doing when they go into the marketplace? Why do we go into the marketplace? So why does, why does Steve Jobs make this? To make money, right? Make money. And, you know, usually the person who says that, I'm not sure in your case, they feel a little uncomfortable because we don't like to admit that we actually do stuff to make money, right? Create value for whom? For the people. So Steve Jobs woke up every day and I was like, he said, I want to make your Ron happy. I want to make those students at Dartmouth happy. Is that what Steve Jobs did, you think? I don't think so. I think Steve Jobs woke up every morning and he said, I want to make something beautiful. I want to make something that I'm proud of. I want to make something that I would enjoy using. I want to make something that I, Steve Jobs, not me, I, reflects me, reflects my values, reflect what my aesthetics, my view of what the world should look like. And yeah, people will benefit from it, but that's not what drives creative talent, other people. What drives them is them. How many focus groups does Steve Jobs do? Anybody, anybody here do marketing? Zero, exactly zero. It doesn't care what we think. He knew exactly what he wanted to create, and he created for whom? Who did, who did Steve Jobs build this for? By himself. He loved us. This. this is out of pure pleasure and pure love. And yes, we all love it too because he was a genius. But entrepreneurs don't get up in the morning and say, what do my customers want? Real entrepreneurs get up in the morning and say, what should they want? What sh am I going to teach them that they want? Great entrepreneurs create demand for their product. The demand is not there before the product is created. Steve Jobs makes this. Producers make stuff for themselves. They're trying to make a living. They're trying to, you know, people who go to work every day. What do you go to work for? Because you love mankind? No, because you're trying to make a living. And hopefully you really love what you do. And you enjoy it. And it's fun. And it's great. Right? And yes, people benefit. We'll get to that. But at the end of the day, you're doing it for you. So producers produce for themselves. Now, I know you guys... When you go shopping, you go shopping because you care about your fellow man. You've read your canes, and you know that consumption drives the economy, and you want to make sure everybody has a job and the GDP grows, so you consume for the benefit of mankind. I'm not going to ask how many do that because there's usually one, and I feel sorry for them. <laughs> Why do you consume? Personal pleasure or personal benefit in some way. It's not just the emotional pleasure. Sometimes you consume, and it's not very pleasurable, but we need it. So we consume in order to make our lives better. Markets and places in which traders meet, buyers and sellers meet, producers and consumers meet, in order to do what? Change value for the purpose of what? Making their own lives better. Markets are inherently self-interested. They're inherently about yourself. The producer is producing because he's trying to make a living and he loves it. The consumer is consuming because he's trying to make a better life and they love it. Some of us, some of you probably are professional consumers and you love just consuming. And that's great. That's what it's about. We have the freedom to pursue our own values, the judgment of our own mind. Everything about capitalism, everything about capitalism smacks of people pursuing their self-interest. People doing what they want to do for themselves. 
for their own pleasure, for their own needs, for their own life. What have we been taught since we were this big about self-interest? Bad, bad stuff. You got to share. Right? Self-interest is bad. I mean, my, I grew up in a good Jewish, you know, good Jewish mother. And, and she taught me, always think of yourself last. Think of other people first. If we think about morality, not economics, not politics, morality, ethics, we think about what is noble, what is good, what is virtuous. We think of what? Sacrifice, being selfless, thinking of others first. Now, nobody actually acts this way, and no mother actually believes it when she tells her kids, but that's not the point. The point is that what activates this idea of morality, goodness, virtue, is selflessness. It's sharing. It's caring for others. And ultimately, it is sacrifice. Above all else, self-sacrifice. Giving up stuff that you have and getting what in return. Nothing. Nothing in this life. It's the only one we have, so it's nothing. And we're taught that being self-interested or selfish is what? What is that associated with? What's that? Greed, which means what? Evil, but how does that manifest itself? How does the evil express itself? Right? Lying, cheating, stealing, just being an SOB. Right? That's what we learned. That self, if you, you point to the kid in the backyard, in the, in the schoolyard, and you say he's being selfish, you don't mean he's taking care of himself. Providing value to other people in a trade, you know, that's not what you mean. You mean he's a lying, cheating, stealing SOB who walk on corpses to get his way. He doesn't care about other people one iota. That's what we're taught. We're presented with this, you know, two versions of ethics, two options in life. You can either be Mother Teresa, suffer, sacrifice, help other people, be miserable in life, and the more miserable the better. That's, you know, how you get sainthood. Or you can be a lying, stealing, cheating SOB. Those are the two options. That's the way it's presented to us as kids. And you can see it all the way grown up. The real good stuff is to be selfless. As if the basketball player passing the ball is being selfless because he wants to win the game. I mean, selflessness would mean the other team should win. No, it's amazingly selfish for him to pass the ball because he wants to win. That's the high value. Think of, um, and, and notice, or I will make the case, that this is not about helping other people. It's not about making the lives of other people better. That's not what virtue is about. Virtue at the end of the day is you being worse off helping other people. I'll give you an example. Take Bill Gates, one of my favorite examples. I mean, Bill Gates is a pretty amazing guy in my view. And he built up Microsoft from nothing. And how did he become a billionaire? How did generally, how do people become billionaires? How do you become a billionaire? That's a secret for success. How do you become a billionaire? How did Bill Gates become a billionaire? What's that? Yeah, you innovate, but lots of people innovate, they don't become billionaires. What does it take to become a billionaire? What's that? He had a nice IPO. Why did he have an IPO? That's just begging the question, right? So what led? IPOs are not just random. They're not just arbitrary. There's a reason why some people IPO and some people don't. Why did he get an IPO? What did he have to do to become a billionaire? What's that? Pursue a dream. Yes, again, most, a lot of us pursue dreams. We don't become billionaires. There's something unique about being a billionaire, right? Somebody said created a lot of value. For whom? Pretty much for everybody, right? So here's the secret to becoming a billionaire. I, you look, I'm an Apple guy as well, but the fact is the world has changed, right? <laughs> Me too. Um, I hate to admit it, but it's true. How do you become a billionaire? You produce a product 
that everybody wants, everybody wants, and is willing to pay you more than it costs you to produce. Pretty simple. Why does everybody want it? What does everybody want? The iPhone. What does everybody want? Wood. Why does everybody want it? What, what's it going to do to their lives? Make it better. So if I pay $1,000 for an iPhone, I mean, it's hard to believe, but this thing costs $1,000. But actually, if you think about what this thing does, $1,000 is like the bargain of the last 100,000 years. <laughs> Best bargain you've ever had. And we're not going to go into all the things this does, because you guys know. But you should sometimes just make a list on a piece of paper. All the things that this guy does, and think, those of us who are old enough maybe, what it would take 20 years ago to produce what this thing does. You'd have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, and you still couldn't do it. Certainly not for the size and, and the convenience. But anyway, I pay $1,000 for this because this is worth, to me, how much? More than $1,000. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother, right? So is my life better or worse off? Just based on my action, without knowing me at all. For buying this, or is it better or worse? It's better because I, I exhibited that. I gave up $1,000, something I think of less, and got something that's more valuable to me, an iPhone. The way to become a billionaire is to get hundreds of millions of people to do that, to buy your stuff, in an effort to make their lives better. So the only way to become a billionaire is to make the lives of hundreds of millions, indeed billions of people, better. And if you can do that over and over and over again, it's easy to be a billionaire. The only way to become a billionaire is to make the world a better place for other people. Whether it's your intent or not. How much moral credit? So Bill Gates, for example, I think changed the world. I don't think there's a human being on planet Earth, maybe with some exception of some tribe in the middle of the Amazon, but there's a, no human being on planet Earth who is not being touched by Microsoft. For better. Even, you know, places in Africa that might have never seen a computer, the aid that gets to them, the logistics of that, are managed by computer systems that would not exist if not for what Bill Gates did 20, 30 years ago. How much moral credit, how much moral ethical credit does Bill Gates get for making the world dramatically better, for making the lives of billions of people better? How much moral credit does he get in Microsoft? None, zero, negative. We, we, we all cheered when the Justice Department went after him. Yes, go get those bastard billionaires, right? We still do. I mean, look at the world around us. There's whole questions that people are posing, AOC and Bernie, you know, should they be billionaires? You know, should they be Jews? Should be this? I mean, it's, who the hell is any of these people to decide who should be and who should not be? But should they be billionaires, right? Unbelievable. But billionaires make the world a better place through trade. But why don't they get any moral credit for making the world a better place? Because they dare to benefit from it. Because they're obviously self-interested. And they're making a lot of money while making the world a better place. Mother Teresa, who did not do anywhere close to the good that Bill Gates has done, who did not improve the world, well, you could argue how much, but I would argue almost nothing, is a saint, a moral saint. Why? Because she didn't benefit from it. Indeed, if you read her diary, she suffered for it. So let's take Bill Gates, bad guy, ran Microsoft, made the world a better place. When does he become a good guy? Yeah, he leaves Microsoft. God forbid you make money. God forbid you create anything. God forbid you build a business. You change the world. No, he leaves Microsoft. Starts a foundation, starts giving his money away. Now he's a good guy. Now we like him. Now he makes all the talk shows and everybody thinks, ooh, Bill Gates is this cool guy. Not a saint. Not a saint. What would it take for Bill Gates to be a saint? To be a real moral hero? Name boulevards after him, build statues. What would it take? Give it all away. Move into a tent. And if you could bleed a little bit for us. <laughs> we need a little bit of bl blood. You need a little bit of suffering in order to really be a moral saint in the world in which we live. If you go to museums, I don't know if there's an art museum here at Dartmouth, there probably is. Look at paintings of saints. You ever see a saint smiling? 
The whole point of sainthood is suffering. The whole point of our morality, of our moral code, is to suffer. It's to be worse off. We've had philosophers. The, the guy who, termed, who coined the term altruism was a philosopher of the 19th century, Augustine Comte, C-O-M-T-E. And Augustine Comte says, a moral action is only moral if you separate yourself from it. If you do it for the sake of the other without any consideration on its effect on you. If, for example, you give charity and you say, I'm going to feel good by giving this, you know, this guy a $10 bill. I'm going to feel good, so I'm doing it to make myself feel good. Not moral anymore. Because you benefited from it. The whole idea of altruism is about sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice. Suffering for the sake of suffering. Not the benefit you give other people. Because if the standard in morality was the benefit you give other people, capitalism would be the most universally identified as the most moral system ever created. Because it's the only system that's benefited anybody. Bill Gates would be a saint for Microsoft. We'd be naming streets and building sculptures for him for being a CEO, for being a billionaire. As would Jeff Bezos and, Bill Ga and Steve Jobs and all these guys. They'd be saints in our culture, but they're not. Because we resent the fact that they benefit off of helping other people. Because in our moral code, in our moral perception, you cannot benefit. If you benefit, it's not moral. It's not ethical. Think of, you know, the symbol of what's considered the most moral man in history. Or what Jordan Peterson calls a superhero. The original superhero. Jesus Christ on a cross. Suffering for sins, who committed? Other people. Not his sins. I can't think of a more unjust thing. I can't think of a more horrible thing than an individual suffering for sins other people commit. And yet that is the ideal of morality. To be willing to sacrifice for the sins of other people. To be willing to sacrifice your own life, your own possessions, your own being for other people. And we internalize that. We reflect that to our kids. Somebody mentioned sharing before. Like Johnny's playing in the sandbox with his truck. And Peter comes around and says, hey, I want to play with that truck. And what do we as parents say immediately? Johnny, you got to share. It's like, really? I mean, if, if, if Johnny had words, he would say, what about my property? Don't I get to make a decision? Or he would say, hey, mom, would you give away keys to a stranger of the car? Why should I share? But we teach them, they have to share. Because we're all communists, really deep down. We reflect that on our kids. And then we become cynical as adults. We're cynics as adults. We don't share as adults. But that's because we're cynical. The ideal is sharing. No. This wasn't a result of sharing. It wasn't a result of community service. This wasn't a result of charity. And there was some charity, some community service, some sh sharing there. But it's not a result of that. It's a result of trade. Why don't we teach our kids to trade? Hey, Peter, what do you have? I've got the truck. What do you have? Let's figure this out. Now, that would be training capitalists. But we're training socialists by emphasizing sharing rather than trading. And notice that socialism is a system completely consistent with our moral code. It's about sharing. It's about sacrifice. I mean, socialism is really big on sacrifice. It's about being selfless. It's about not doing what's in your interest, but in doing what you're told or in doing what somebody thinks is in the good of society, in a common interest. Where private property is viewed as overly selfish, overly self-interested, we shouldn't have it. Yeah, we have some of it because, you know, they, you know, the, the, the socialists are not idealists. They, they, want to, they, they allow you to have a little bit of private property, just not too much. It's ideal for our current system. And we get to be poor, which is virtuous, right? So our ethics, our moral code for the last 2,000 years, religious and secular, is incompatible with capitalism. Capitalism... The political system, the economic system is way ahead of where our ethical code is, where our morality is.
And in my view, Ayn Rand's biggest contribution, philosophically, ideologically, is to catch us up. It's to provide us a moral code that is consistent with human life. It's consistent with wealth creation, with productivity. I mean, it's not surprising that over the first 100,000 years, we didn't have a proper moral code. Because, you know, what, what did Hobbes describe life as? Short, brutish, nasty, brutish, and short. Nasty, brutish, and short. And it was. <laughs> right? So, you know, it's understandable that you couldn't think about self-interest and what that led to and what billionaires do. But we've just lived through an industrial revolution. We've lived through a second industrial revolution, a third one. We, we see the what technology does, we've seen the world under freedom. We can see the contrast. What we need now is a moral code that fits, a moral code that actually fits human life. The moral code that the founders should have had when they founded this country because implicit, it's implicit in the idea of the founding. Because the founding is not, the Declaration of Independence is not an altruistic document. There's nothing about social well-being or the common good it's all about what? Your inalienable right. Inalienable. Nobody can take it away. To pursue whose happiness? Your own. Pretty selfish. They didn't have the morality, the moral code, to defend that. And that's, to a large extent, why it all went away, or is going away as we speak. What we need is a new moral code. A moral code that defends the idea of self-interest. That asks the question, a simple question about all these other moral theories. One word question, why? Why should I sacrifice for you? Why is your life more important than mine, to me? Why are your values more important than my values, to me? That's it, there's no answer to that, other than somebody said so, fill in the blank on who the somebody is, the dictator, the god, the, 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 the political leader, the tribal leader, the witch doctor, whatever. But there's no rational, logical explanation for why I shouldn't live for me. It's my life, after all. It's your life, after all. And you got one shot at it. There's no second try. You know, if incarnation is real, you might not be reincarnated as a human being. So it's irrelevant. Right? Only one shot. So why shouldn't I live for me? Why shouldn't I live for my happiness, my success? And then, of course, you have to answer the question as well, does my success... Does my happiness, does being truly self-interest really require that I lie, steal, cheat, that I be an SOB? Is that really the, the recipe for success in life? I mean, if you look around the world, <laughs> the answer is pretty obvious, no. So maybe there's not just two alternatives. Maybe there's a third, which is living a life for yourself Long-term thinking about what makes your life the best that it can be. Where lying, cheating, and stealing are wrong, not just because they hurt other people, but primarily because they hurt you, yourself. They undermine who you are, your own integrity, your own values, your own virtues. And that's what Rand is really presenting us in the book to read there is The Virtue of Selfishness, where she talks about the virtue of living for yourself and why it's right, and what it requires. Now, we don't have time to go into the whole thing, but let's just one basic idea of what a life, if you were truly self-interested, all you cared about, all you cared about, emphasis on all, was yourself, was your own life. What would be the most important thing to you? What would be the number one value and virtue for you? Happiness, peace of mind are the end result. That's what you want to achieve. But what do you have to pursue in order to achieve happiness and peace of mind? Freedom is a very far removed abstract concept before you get there. Freedom to do what? To live. What does life require? So look at this room. We've got a pretty, pretty cool room, right? What does everything in this room depend on? Every single thing in this room that was built, created, made is a product of one thing. The human mind, human reason, human rationality. You know, we're pathetic animals. Just look around the room. Pathetic. We're weak. 
We're slow. We have no claws. We have no fangs. I mean, try running down a bison and biting into it. But there's probably a place here in Dartmouth, in Hanover, where you can get a bison burger. How come? Or think about you and a saber-toothed tiger. Who's going to win that? A saber-toothed tiger. Yet, the last time I saw a saber-toothed tiger, it was in a museum, and it was just a skeleton. And here you are, sitting comfortably in a heated room with all kinds of technology that were just unimaginable even 150 years ago, never mind today. Some stuff unimaginable even 50 years ago. How did that happen? How do we beat the saber-toothed tiger and get to where we are today? Build skyscrapers. The use of the human mind. Human reason, rationality, is what makes us human. It what makes every value we pursue possible. It is the most important thing in our lives. There is nothing more important than your mind. There's nothing more important than taking your mind seriously, and taking reason seriously, and figuring out what it means to think and how to think. Being able to control your emotions when you're thinking. Be able to only deal with facts and not ignore relevant facts. Doing logic, doing real thinking, real reasoning, real rational thought. Observing, integrating facts, only letting facts into the equation. Not your wishes, not your whims, not other people's wishes, not other people's whims. But treating your life like it was science. That's the number one pursuit of a selfish human being. Because that's where values come from. They come from your mind. So for Rand, to be an egoist means to be a rational egoist. She would view that as redundant. To be an egoist means to be rational. And to be rational means that you're long-term. So to be an egoist means a long-term rational human being. That's what it means. And that's an achievement. We're not all rational automatically. <laughs> Most people are not rational at all. You have to make an effort to be rational. You have to make an effort to think clearly. You have to make an effort to control your emotions, for example, or to be willing to look to places where it might be uncomfortable to look. So, for Rand, your own self-interest and ultimately your own happiness is what life is about. It's about thinking and acting in pursuit of what you believe will lead to your own success. Not sacrificing yourself to other people, but not asking other people to sacrifice to you either. Not exploiting other people. They have the same right to pursue their happiness as you do to pursue yours. And if you're going to live, you should live on your own terms, not dependent on other people. So, a human being that is focused on their own interest, that's focused on their own happiness, that wants to live a good life, that wants to be happy, ultimately. What do they require in order to achieve that politically? Freedom. They don't want mother, you know, mother government sitting on their shoulder, don't drink that Coke, it's too big. That's Bloomberg, a Bloomberg joke, right? Don't start that business. You can't pay your employees that. You have to negotiate there. You have to do this. You have to do that. You, they want to be left alone. If you're really pursuing your own values, your own life, you want to be left free to try stuff, to fail sometimes, to explore, to test, to pursue your dreams, to pursue your values, to live for yourself, for your happiness. Free of intervention, free of force, free of coercion, free of people sticking their guns in your head. Because what is the enemy of reason? Force, coercion. If I put a gun to your head, you can't think. You can, but it's irrelevant. You have two options. Do what I tell you or die. Your thoughts are irrelevant. When Galileo is put in house arrest because he dared contradict an ancient book by saying that the earth goes around the sun... He didn't go into house arrest saying, okay, now I sit down and come up with new theories in physics. No, that shut down. That option was gone. He couldn't publish it. He couldn't communicate it. Couldn't talk about it. Why think it? 
the enemy of thought, the enemy of reason, the enemy of rationality is the gun. It is coercion. So somebody who values his own mind, values his own values, values his own life, resists force, resists coercion, resists authority, resists having to ask for permission to act in life. And therefore, by definition, is a capitalist. So the morality of self-interest, Rand's rational morality of self-interest, is, I believe, the only moral theory that we have today consistent with capitalism. Now, I don't advocate for the morality because it's consistent with capitalism. I advocate for the morality because it's good for me, and it's good for each one of you to live your life. Capitalism is an outcome because we're all, we would all demand freedom. So if we care about our own freedom, our own lives, if we care about prosperity, if we care about the world, then the real revolution that has to happen, and this is why it's so difficult, is a moral revolution. We've won the economic debates. Sorry, Paul Krugman, but we won those debates. Long time ago. Got great economists. They won Nobel Prizes. We got plenty of economists on the free market side that can rip these guys to shreds on the facts. We won the historical debate. History is on the side of capitalism, unequivocally. Fact, history, economics are all on our side. The only thing that's not is the most important thing of all, and that is morality. What we need is a moral revolution. We need to trash the old morality of altruism, the old morality that keeps us down, that requires us to ask permission. And we need to assert a new morality, a morality of self-interest, a morality of self-esteem, a morality of the pursuit of happiness, a morality that implicitly the founders understood. When we can stand up and say that it's truly an inalienable right of every individual to pursue their own happiness, that not only is that a good political goal, but it's a good moral goal, that's when we win the battle for capitalism. And we don't until we do that. Thank you all. All right, I think we got time for questions. We have a microphone. It's traveling around. So start in the back and we'll move forward. Thank you. What do you have to say to people with mental or physical disabilities who can't work the same way the rest of us can and therefore wouldn't survive under a completely cap capitalist system? So people who can't survive on their own, first, let's be clear. It's a tiny fraction of the number of people on planet Earth, right? It's well less than 1%. It's a tiny, tiny fraction of people. People who can't survive through their own means depend on other people. So there are only two options they have. They can force other people to help them, which I think is bad for them and bad for the people who they're forcing, or they can ask for the help and get voluntary assistance. I am against force. I think it's wrong. I think the person who's getting the help knows that they had to force it upon somebody. It creates resentment there. It creates, it creates resentment across the entire system. And at the end of the day, if they just ask for help, I always ask audiences, in every audience, anywhere in the world, you can ask the question, how many of you would be willing to help people who truly cannot help themselves for whatever reason, they cannot help themselves for no fault of their own, how many of you are willing to voluntarily help them? Every hand in the room goes up. So why do I need a government with a policeman to, to come to my door and take my money away so, to support them? Why can't we just form charities? Maybe the charities can compete on who's going to be more effective helping them, all kinds of things you can imagine. But it's not, no, I can't imagine a world in which that would be a problem. Oh, I thought there was a, okay. There's, there's plenty in the middle here as well. Um, thank you for your talk. I have a question. Like when you say that um, um, that we everybody should be equal in pursuing the right to freedom, right? Um, there is an implicit uh, assumption there that says that we are all at equal footing, but people who are born in poverty, they're not, right? So how do we address that? We don't. 
I mean, I don't, I, yeah, we're not equal. Look around. We're not equal. We're not equal in looks. We're not equal in intelligence. We're not equal in height. We're not equal in ability to play basketball. We're not equal in anything. So what should we do? Should we take intelligent people and make them dumber? Should we take LeBron James and break his leg so I can play basketball with him? No, no. I, I mean, I'm serious here, right? So we have this idea that equality is an ideal when it comes to outcomes or when it comes to so-called opportunities, which is just other forms of outcomes. The only equality, the only, the only meaning equality has is equality of rights, equality of liberty, equality of freedom, equality before the law. And I would fight that a poor person and a rich person are treated the same by the law. They have the same right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It doesn't mean that they're starting in the same place. They're not. But none of us start at the same place. Again, some of us are more intelligent than other people. So inequality is metaphysical. It's part of life. To fight inequality is to fight the very nature of existence. And that's why it always, any fight against inequality leads to disaster and destruction. I just watched a movie, which I recommend because it shows the horror of these things, but it's a pretty depressing movie. Uh, I think it's called They First Killed My Father. And it, it was made by Angelina Jolie. It's a very slow movie, movie, but it shows the horror of trying to achieve equality. Right? It, it, so, I don't know if you know this movie, but it's a it's, um, quick story, okay? So, uh, true story. So, once upon a time, there was this group of intellectuals who went to Paris and studied in Paris with the best philosophers of the time. They studied at the Sorbonne, at the best universities, and they learned. What did they learn? They learned equality. They learned that we should all be equal, that we should, we should have an equal, egalitarian society. So they said, okay, one day we'll get, it, we'll get political power and we'll implement this. So they, they went back to their homeland, and they did. They got political power, and they started implementing it. But first they saw, oh, this is a problem. Some people live in the city, and that gives them huge advantages. And other people live in the countryside. And that's a huge disadvantage. So how do we make them equal? We empty the city. We get rid of everybody. We force everybody to go in the countryside. And watch the movie because the movie starts as the people are leaving the city. It's a true story. Everybody, the city was basically emptied of human beings. Everybody went to the countryside. Now, you still have a problem because some people can read. Some people are good farmers, some people are good foragers, some people are good workers, some people are strong, some people are weak. You still have lots of inequality. What do you do? What do you do when you have some people who are educated and some people who are not? Some people are smart, some people who are not. Some people are good at their work and some people are not. What, how do you get equality? Well, basically, you kill everybody who stands out. So if they wore glasses, it was a sign that you probably read or you probably lived in the cities. They shot you. If you had a college degree, a high school degree, they shot you. If you exhibited any outstanding ability in any field, they shot you. This is a true story. They landed up killing 30 to 40% of their entire population in the name of equality. Because it's the only way to get it. So keep chopping people down. Keep chopping people down so you get everybody down to the lowest common denominator. Uh, if you're curious about it, Watch the movie and read about it. It's Cambodia. It's the Khmer Rouge. It happened not that long ago. I was alive. It was in the 70s. Uh, and it was, it was literally they killed between 30, nobody knows exactly, somewhere between 30 to 40% of their own people were slaughtered in mass graves in the name of equality. So equality to me, the idea that we're going to be equal is horrific. We are not equal. Just embrace it. Accept it. It is. Some kids are born poor. And I know kids who are born poor do very well in life. I know other people who don't. And the freer a society is, the more opportunities there are, not equal, but the more opportunities there are, the more likelihood there is that poor kids do well. All right, we've got... Hi. Um, so you talked about how like, the only way... You said the only way a billionaire can become a billionaire is by helping a million people. I mean, or not the only way. The only way in a free market. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just I have a bit of an issue with that in terms of like arms dealers or in, in global warming, for example. Like in global uh, let's what? say yeah, for global warming. Yep. Like Exxon Mobil. Sure, the a million people that they're doing business with might be benefiting from their business with them. What happens to the seven billion people in the world? 
that are being disadvantaged by. So, so let's take mobile because it's a great example. But I do want to get the arms dealer as well because I think it's more relevant. I mean, all of us are better off because of mobile. I, I know you guys believe that the greatest evil in the world is fossil fuels. But the reason you're alive right now is because of fossil fuels. The reason you can have this heating is because of fossil fuels. The reason that fewer people every single year die from weather-related events is because of fossil fuels. It's because of the energy they produce and therefore the quality of life that we have. So whether the world globe is warming or not, demonizing fossil fuels cannot be the answer because fossil fuels is what gives you life. There is no civilization today on planet Earth without fossil fuels. So mobile is one of the greatest companies. I mean, I mean not mobile, the oil industry. is one of the greatest industries in all of human history. It has contributed more to this than any other industry, and there's nobody on the planet who hasn't benefited from it. So, I mean, it's, again, it's, if you, if you look at weather-related deaths, that's the trend. Whether there are more hurricanes or not, fewer people are dying from hurricanes. Whether there are more tornadoes or not, fewer people are dying from tornadoes. Why? Because we have the capacity to protect ourselves. How do we have the capacity to protect ourselves? Because of energy. Where does the energy come from? At least today, it all comes from fossil fuel pretty much. And the idea that that can be replaced like this without millions of people dying. I mean, hundreds of millions of people dying if you replaced fossil fuels today with anything else. I mean, that's the cost. And that's evil. So, yeah, if there are better sources of fuel, nuclear comes to mind, but it's the one fossil fuel the activists don't want, or the one fuel that activists don't want. Nuclear might be able to replace a lot of fossil fuels, but other than that, everything else is a fantasy. Solar, wind, are all fantasies that will never contribute more than 10, maybe 20% of the energy requirements that human people need. More than that, take Africa where people are still poor, very poor. How are they going to get rich? Part of how we got rich is by using cheap sources of energy. The only way Africa is ever going to get rich is by using cheap sources of energy, which means fossil fuels. So by denying them fossil fuels, you're basically saying you're going to be poor forever. How's that right? Sort of warm a little bit. No, I'm serious. Sort of warm a little bit. We're human beings. We'll figure it out. We'll buy more air conditioning. We'll build better dikes. We'll, we'll create systems that preserve human life in spite of the fact that it's warming. We don't, the thing that makes us human is we don't let the environment kill us. We actually figure out ways and how to live no matter what the environment is. We came out of Africa, yet we live in Iceland. We live in Siberia. We live in the Sahara Desert. I don't know how to live in the Sahara Desert. Way too hot. But that's what it means to be human. We can use our minds to adapt our environment to whatever the weather produces. Yes, there are people out there who are billionaires because they've stolen it. They've lied, cheated for it. They've engaged in illegal activity or immoral activity. From drug dealers to arms dealers to... Uh, to cronies, to people who've bribed the government to, to provide. First, that is the minority of billionaires. If you look at the list, almost all of them actually created value, and you can identify the value of Microsoft, Apple, uh, Walmart, real value that they've created. They've made lives of people much better off. It's a minority. And second, in a true free market, what happens to cronyism? What's cronyism? Cronyism is the appeal to government to give you favors. What happens to cronyism in a true free market? It disappears because government has no favors to give. The essence of capitalism is a separation of state from economics, where government doesn't control economic stuff, doesn't have economic policy, and therefore has no favors to give, and therefore nobody lobbies them because there are no favors to give. The freer an economy, the less cronyism there is. The more socialist an economy, the more cronyism there is. There's far more cronyism in, in Europe than there is in the United States. It's just institutionalized in Europe. The bribes are, 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 are presented as legit, but it's the same thing. So a lot of those, a lot of those, you know, in my world, drugs are legal. What happens to the profits from drugs if they're legal? They basically plummet. 
So nobody's going to make money off of cocaine if cocaine was legal. The only reason they make money off of cocaine today is because it's illegal. The, the fact that it's illegal creates, you know, concentration of powers of people who are willing to wield guns in order to preserve their trade. But in a competitive market, the profit goes down. So it's a commodity. Cocaine is a commodity. So the more free we are, the fewer billionaires are going to be who don't deserve to be billionaires. They might still be some, but very few. There's a question here in the front. She's been patient. Thank you for coming and for your energy and your talk. Um, OK, uh, my question is about the coercion aspect of capitalism. Yep. Um, this is something I can't really wrap my head around, is that people who create desire for people in the developed world for certain commodities, I feel that in a way that is coercive, um, because the desire is created to such an extent that through what we purchase, we are perpetuating you know, child labor, um, bonded labor, the labor that's responsible for producing um, clothes in the fast fashion industry, palm oil in our food, sure. you know, that kind of desire that trumps our care for other people, it, it seems like, how, how could we have... So let, wait, so, wait, um, I'm not done. <laughs> okay, can I answer that and then you can ask sure, another sure. question? Yeah. So I, there, there are at least two big issues there. One is somebody creates a desire in you. No, I mean, take credit. Whatever desire you have, you chose. So you're responsible for it. Nobody's, nobody, nobody has brainwashed you to want Starbucks, right? You want Starbucks because you've made that decision. And you can make a decision not to have Starbucks. Tomorrow, you can boycott Starbucks if that's what you want, right? So it's not nasty corporations brainwashing us to want stuff. It's us choosing to engage in that activity. Uh, we have free will. I don't believe in that advertising programs us that advertise. I don't believe in subliminal nonsense. Uh, to the extent that you don't think, I, I think about stuff before I buy it. I make choices. And if I think, I don't know why I desire this, then I don't do it, right? So that's one. Second, child labor is a massive improvement in the world. So children who work, is a massive benefit to the children and their families. Not forever, but let's be clear, before the Industrial Revolution, what did children do? They did two things. They died. It's not funny. 50% of kids never made the age of 10 before the Industrial Revolution. 50% of kids didn't make the age of 10, and that's still true in much of the developing world. 50% of kids don't make the age of 10. Second, they worked. They didn't work in factories. They worked in the field. Worse conditions. More back baking. baking. And, and all they had was they got up in the morning, went to the field, and they went to bed when the sun set. That, that was life. Now you bring a factory into a town in Indonesia or Malaysia or China or whatever. And these kids who were working in the field, it's not like they were in school and now they're being pulled from school and put into a factory. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. They, they leave the field. And now they're working in a factory. Why are they willing to leave the field and work in the factory? Because they're making more money in the factory than they did in the field. They're supporting their family. They're allowing the family now to raise their standard of living. When do they stop working in factories? And, and this is an, an amazing book about sweatshops that shows that pretty much every country in the world stops child labor at pretty much the same point. What is that point? When the family is making enough income, without the kids working, to feed the kids, then the kids stop working. Because no family wants their kids working. So as soon as they make enough to feed the kids, the kids go to school. Now, if you ban child labor in these countries, before that happens, then the kid either goes back into the field to work, or they starve to death. Those are the only two options. Now, you can give them charity, but you can never give enough charity to make up for the amount of poverty that exists in the world. And by the way, during this horrible period in which ch children have worked, what has happened to, to uh, extreme poverty in the world? What, how, how many people today in the world in which we live live in extreme poverty, which is defined by the United Nations as $2 a day or less? How many people in the world today live at $2 a day or less? 20? 
Anybody else? You guys are well educated. What's that? How much? Three? All right. So this is a very optimistic group for the most part. Um, it's 8%. So you said is right. It's actually exactly 8%. What was it 30 years ago? Anybody know what it was 30 years ago? 30 years ago is 30%. Over the last 30 years, we've gone from 30% extreme poverty to 8% extreme poverty. How did we do that? How did that happen? I mean, first of all, that should be something we should be celebrating every single day. We should be dancing in the streets. A billion, over a billion people have come out of extreme poverty over the last 30 years, and nobody knows it. Nobody knows it because your teachers don't teach you this stuff. The press doesn't advertise this stuff. It, it's not anywhere. How did it happen? Because of a little bit of capitalism and some child labor. You can't get there without the child labor. You cannot get from extreme poverty to middle classhood without children working in the process. In the West, we had child labor in the 19th century as part of that transition from extreme poverty to wealth. In China, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and, and soon in Africa, I hope in Africa, they will have child labor as a phase from going from extreme poverty to middle classhood, to wealth. That is the necessary transition. And if you cut it out, you you're making them extremely poor forever. So I'm a big fan of child labor in that context. <laughs> That's a good uh, meme, right? Iran yeah. is in favor of child labor. You've got a second question, yeah. and then we'll um, go to the back. This is a follow-up on your first response about free will. We yeah. choose what we buy. Um, like, you and I think about our purchases before we make them, yeah. but we're talking about not theoretical capitalism, but real capitalism, where not everyone reflects upon... Yeah, so this is, this, is why, this is why I would like to see us teaching people morality. Yeah. And to me, teaching people morality means teaching people to think. That's the essential thing about morality is to think. Not do stuff because it feels good. Not do stuff because people expect you to do stuff. Not do stuff because the commercial told you to do stuff. Do stuff because you think and you think it's good for you. So I don't blame the companies. I blame us in not teaching a proper morality. If you teach morality as, so morality for Aristotle, just a little bit of philosophy, right? Morality for Aristotle was the study of what are the virtues and values that individuals should pursue in order to achieve happiness. It's an empirical study about what actually achieves eudaimonia for individuals, success, flourishing for human beings. If we had a moral code today, if we thought about morality in those terms, then these problems would go away because people think for themselves. And I am not a snob. I know many people are. But I don't think, oh, I can think, but oh, those people, they can't think for themselves. They're too stupid. No, I think every human being, and this is the great insight of the Enlightenment, this is why the Declaration of Independence declares all men are created equal. Equal in what? Not in their abilities, but equal in the fact that they can reason. So everybody should be taught to think for themselves. That's where we should focus. I think also this is probably There's awesome. like a bunch of people behind yeah. you that want to ask questions. Uh, so maybe this gentleman here, and then we'll go to the back of the room. Well, a number of things. Uh, I mean, the Danish prime minister was pretty good at combating that thing, suggestion, because when Bernie said, you know, I want socialism like they have in Denmark and Sweden, the Danish prime minister the next day came out and did a press conference and said, we're not socialists. <laughs> and they're not. And if you go to Denmark, you don't see the means of production owned by the state. You don't see the workers owning the businesses. You see tons of private property, tons of private businesses, amazing unregulated markets, less regulated than in the U.S. If you look at countries based on the ease of doing business, companies, Denmark scores higher or very close to the United States. It's not like we're capitalists and they're socialists. So first, that's bizarre. 
They do more redistribution of wealth, but less regulation. We do more regulation and less redistribution of wealth. But it's all the spectrum of mixed economies. Second, who said the Danes are happy? They said, because they're asked, right? I mean, who cares what they say, right? You ask me, you know, I, 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 as you figured out, I come from a Jewish household. Yes, Jews, if they're happy. Yeah, you laugh, right? Because nobody, no Jew says yes. <laughs> Even if they are happy, you just don't say yes. Like everybody else will say, you happy? How can you be happy? What's happiness? Define happiness. You know, they, 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 there's, there's this constant questioning. You, you know, you just don't do it. Cultures have, and Scandinavia, if you say you're unhappy, then they look at you. What, what makes you different? Why are you unhappy? We're all happy here. This is what you're supposed to be as a Danish. So you got to really be cautious of happiness studies. Happiness studies is a very, very difficult. Art. What is happiness? They very rarely define it. Even, yeah, I mean, Aristotle had a hard time defining happiness. Not an easy idea to define. So I would question that. And look, at the end of the day, that Bernie won't do more than move us towards Denmark, right? We're not going to have communism in the United States. He, he will ne he's not going to have, not in the short run anyway, maybe in the very long run. Uh, and, and Bernie's going to raise taxes and regulate a little bit more and maybe nationalize one or two things. But there's not going to be a lot happening. And he can get away with saying stuff like that because he knows that there's checks and balances on what he actually does and, and what he's going to say. But no, if you actually look at his, what he wants to do, it's way to the left of Denmark and Sweden. Way to the left of Denmark and Sweden. Denmark and Sweden have privatized over the last 30 years everything they can think of. Sweden has school vouchers. We don't have school vouchers in this country. Sweden is, is in many respects more free than we are. In some respects. In other respects, not so much. High taxes. I always, I always I ask people, this is an experiment I'd love to run, right? Everybody says Scandinavia is so wonderful. Everybody's happy there. By the way, here, here's some, before I run the experiment, here's some just pure stats. Swedes in America, Swedish people and Danish people in America, people have looked at this. Like in Minnesota, Minnesota has a lot of Swedes, are happier than Swedes in Sweden. Danes in America are richer than Danes in Denmark. Scandinavians generally in the United States live just as long as Scandinavians in Scandinavia. So when you isolate the cultural characteristics, suddenly there's no difference, if anything. Uh, but, but what's true is Scandinavians in America live in bigger houses, drive bigger cars, and generally are wealthier. Yes. Oh, you and then, then her. OK. So. You told us that people were inherently selfish, right? No, I didn't say that. You told us that people should be selfish, but yes. they're not inherently selfish. I wish they were. They should care about themselves. Yes. I mean, right? Yes. But then you tell us that the solution to inequality, when you brought up the inequality question, was that we should have free markets and have people just donate to charity. So it seems like these ideas are contradictory, right? No. People should become more selfish, yet people should donate more to charity. And uh, well, so wait, my wait, question. Wait. Let, me, let me just correct you on what I said. I didn't say people should donate more to charity. I said people will donate to charity when they're free. It's not should and it's not more. I don't know what the number will be. So people will donate to charity yes. even though, even though they should more become more selfish. Yes, yes. So it seems to me like there's a contradiction there. And also the second question is on the question of solving inequality, the big problem is that wealth from previous generations locks out people in current generations. So do you believe in things like inheritance taxes, to ensure that people who actually deserve the wealth that they have keep it and don't get to pass yeah. it down to their children. So you're making a lot of assumptions there. So for, let me take the first one first. Um, well, actually, let me take the second one because I'll forget, I'll forget the concrete you said. The first one is easy. Um, you're saying we have to solve the problem of inequality. There is no problem. You, you've, you're assuming there's a problem without establishing there's a problem. There's no literature that there's a problem. There's, there's, all there is is the identification that inequality is higher. Why is that a problem? There is nobody, nobody states that. Now, you might say there's a problem of mobility. Poor people are now rising up and up. But that's not a problem of inequality. That is a very, so the whole idea that inequality is a problem is good brainwashing. It's Thomas Piketty and Paul Krugman, who, by the way, takes $250,000 to give a speech about the evil of inequality. Talk about hypocrites. But it's, it's, there is no problem of inequality. There's a problem of poverty. There's a problem of lack of social mobility. 
There are all these problems that exist. There's a problem of slow economic growth. None of them, not a single one of them, is related in any way to inequality. You also state that there is this barrier to rising because of uh, because uh, inheritance. Why is that a barrier? That is, if I leave my kids a lot of money, how does that hurt you? It doesn't hurt you. It might spoil my kids. It might hurt my kids because I'll be spoiled now and they won't know what to do with the money and they'll, they'll waste it, but it doesn't hurt you. My leaving my kids money, it's not your money. It's not your money. It's nobody's money. It's my money. I could burn it for all you should care. I choose to give it to my kids, which is probably a bad idea if I give them too much, right? But it's my decision what I do with that money. I choose to give to my kids. In addition, kids who are not worthy of that money, who don't live up to it in a sense of being productive, creating stuff, usually lose it. But they do. If you look at the top, uh, the, the top richest people in this country, there's very few that inherited it. That's just, that's just, that's just not true. Of what, billionaires? It's just not true. That is a stat out of the man, that is manufactured by somebody with an agenda. But it's just not true. The only people in the very top of the billionaire list who inherited the money are the Waltons. And they've done a pretty good job at that. But the fact is, not only that, if you look at the number of people who are in the billionaire list today, and uh, what the list was tw 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it's a completely different list. The list completely changes. And, and there's been tons of academic research about this. So, so, that's, so, so number two, I don't think that inherited wealth matters that much. I don't think it's a big factor. No, I don't believe in inherited taxes because I think it taxes my ability to choose what I want to do with my money before I die. And it's my choice. It's not yours. It's none of your business what I do with my stuff. Again, I could burn it. And it's none of your business. I choose to give it to my kids, which is, in my case, almost like burning it. Right? Um, <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Um, and I'm not dying anytime soon. Uh, so the, the issue is mobility. And I, I'm with you. I think there's a real problem of mobility. Mobility, it seems like mobility is really the ability of poor people to rise up. It seems to have shrunk over the last 50 years, let's say. And the question is why? And I have a theory of why, and I think it's pretty, pretty solid and pretty established. Because if you look at history again, where do you see where and when do you see the most poor people rising up into middle classhood? Under what conditions? Under what con conditions do poor people rise up into the middle class and become rich? When, when is the period in which we talk about from rags to riches? The Industrial Revolution. The periods in which there was the least amount of regulation, the least amount of taxes, the least amount of, of, of controls. The most capitalist periods in history are the periods in which there is most social mobility. Even Piketty admits that. He just then rationalizes away and waves his hand. I, I, think, I assume you know who Thomas Piketty is because he wrote that famous, horrible book. Um, <laughs> das Kapital in the 21st century. So the solution to, and, and, and why is mobility restrained today? I'll give you a few little examples. One, licensing laws. So if you're a poor person and you're, trying, you're struggling to make a living, do you have money to go and be trained on how to shampoo hair? Because in California, you need a license to shampoo hair. Shampoo hair. I can do it for myself. But if I did it for you, I'd need a license. Now, who can afford that license? Somebody who has a little bit of money. Not the poor person who's trying to rise up. And everything is licensed today. Everything. And it has nothing to do with protecting the consumer. Nobody cares about the consumer. Who doesn't want more people shampooing hair? Who? The people who already shampoo hair who don't want the competition. My, my son's girlfriend was a, um, oh, ex-girlfriend, was a, was a, <laughs> unfortunately, she was a psychologist. She got a master's in psychology. She couldn't practice privately until she did 2,000 hours of, in, of, of uh, interning at a very, very low wage. Which, you know, you do that under the assumption that half the people are not going to stick with 2,000, then they're going to go switch professions. Then she has to take a test. And only then do they allow her to have a private practice in psychology. Who does that hurt? That new up-and-comer who's trying to be successful, who's trying to rise up in the middle class. That's one. Second, taxing the rich. 
reduces the ability of the poor to rise up. Why? What do rich people do with their money? No, they don't. I mean, they donate it. Donating doesn't matter in life. What do they? They spend it? Really? Rich people don't spend their money. I mean, I mean, you buy a yacht, you buy an airplane. How many more yachts are you going to buy? No, the fact is that rich people don't consume a lot. It's why Keynesian hates rich people. Because, you know, if you believe consumption drives the economy, you don't want rich people because rich people don't consume. The problem with rich people is, problem in quotes, is they save it. What, what does that mean? They invest it. What does investment do? What is the outcome of investment? Which means what? Which means creating jobs. Rich people, whether you like it or not, even when they're passive, they're not doing anything, they're just putting the money in the bank, create jobs. Because the bank lends money to a small business who then hires people, or to a big business that builds another plant and hires thousands of people. But when you tax wealth, and you tax this, the, the highest marginal rate, when you increase the highest marginal rate, you're hurting job creation. Who does hurting job creation hurt? The people looking for a first job. The last example I give you, the most controversial, I guess, minimum wage. I can't think of a more evil policy than the minimum wage. Because it helps some people. But who does it hurt? The poorest of the poor. The people who are the least trained, have the least productive knowledge. Because they are priced out of the labor market. And they're institutionalized into poverty forever. Because if you don't get that first job, you'll never get a second or third. If you don't start somewhere, you'll never rise up to middle classhood. So if you look at all the policies we have instituted, the so-called reduced inequality, they are the policies to blame for the poverty and for the lack of mobility. Free markets are the only, the only system in human history to bring people out of poverty. This is the graph that shows it. We were all poor once. We instituted free markets. We became middle class. Asia was poor until very recently. They instituted free markets. A billion people came out of middle class. Africa today is still poor. Most of the extreme poverty is in Africa. But if you look at countries like Rwanda, Botswana, Namibia, that are instituting private property, a little bit of a rule of law, what's happening to them? The GDP, the fastest growing economies in the world today, are in Africa are in countries that are adopting a little bit of capitalism. It works always, everywhere. And the more you restrain it, the more poor people suffer. And it's the poor who suffer more. You know, you can tax me another 10%, another 20%, another 50%. It's not going to dramatically change my life. I've done well in life. You know, worked hard, started with nothing, worked hard, done well. You can tax more. You're not going to hurt me that much. But you know who you hurt? You're hurting the guy who's trying to find that, or the girl trying to find that first job. That's easy to hurt that. We've got the girl there who's been waiting, and then we'll move up. Um, yeah. <laughs> this question was actually related to mine. So if Put you the mic to... in front of you. Thank you. I'm not sure. Oh, yes, Nagel. it is. Um, so I just wanted to go back to this idea of um, a possible inconsistency, especially with your Oh, sorry, I didn't do the. I didn't do the first question. Right, okay, yeah. So go for it. So if um, you want to flesh it out, that's fine. Sure. So I, I'm just curious about your answer to the first question that was asked um, and this idea that people, like, descriptively sure. will help other people, um, though it seems in your, um, in the ideal world of, of rational egoism, people would not help other people. Um, the sure. ultimate, my ultimate question is, um, given that you don't believe in the use of force or coercion um, and you believe that people descriptively will help other people, yeah. I was wondering what you see as the role of the state at all, like whether the government should exist at all if they're yeah. not going to use force. Yeah, great question. So first, let me address the charity thing. Look, my rational self-interest involves caring for other people. Not everybody. There's some people I clearly don't care for. And I would not help even in, a, in any circumstances. But generally, I have a positive view of human beings. Why? Why is it in my self-interest? Because it's rational. If I look around, if I look at other human beings, what do they mostly do? They mostly create and produce and do things that indirectly benefit my life. I'm better off for having people out there all over the world working and producing and thinking and creating. and It's wonderful. And if somebody falls on bad luck or if somebody's born with bad luck, look, egoists like me, and I'm, I consider myself an egoist, right? I, I, you know, my wife really cares for plants. 
you know, I know a lot of people who love their dogs and their cats. Why? Because they get something. They get a value out of it. I don't get plants and I don't get animals. But I get human beings. I get a human value from people uh, enjoying life, from people happiness, from people getting, getting a great job, getting a promotion, living a good life. I don't want to see suffering. Suffering is, is unpleasant. And I don't want people to suffer because I don't think it's what's possible for human beings. And I, have, I, I would be incredibly generous, not out of any sense of altruism, but out of a sense of wanting to live in the best world I can think of living in towards people who, who suffer. So I would consider it selfish to help. Not everybody. Again, I would be very selective. Like, I love children. So most of my charity would go to help children you know, uh, uh, children in poverty, children to go to school, maybe cancer treatment, whatever, right? Other people might like other stuff. And the beauty of it is we would choose who to help based on our values, based on what made you happy, not based on some bureaucrat's decision of this is how you help people, which, in, which you know, I always ask people, I mean, in every one of these things, what do you think this would look like? This is an iPhone, right? What do you think this would look like if the government designed it? Everybody laughs. No matter what the politics of the audience is, they all laugh. Socialists laugh, right? But that's okay. So let's do charity, which is more important. Let's do charity through the government because that'll look better than an iPhone. Let's do healthcare through the government because that'll work. Let's do education through the government because that'll, that'll, you know, it's really. I mean, if we don't trust the government with an iPhone, why do we trust them with education? Why do we trust them with healthcare? Why do we even trust them with charity? The real point that Ayn Rand makes about charity and by the way, Ayn Rand gave to charity. But the real point that Ayn Rand makes to charity is you don't get your moral gold stars, your moral, your, 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 your moral um, value from charity. Charity is a nice thing to do. But it's not what makes you moral. Think about Bill Gates. Bill Gates, what makes him moral is the charity he does. Warren Buffett, the same thing. If they didn't do charity, we'd think they were horrible people. Ayn Rand's saying, no, charity is, is not a major virtue. It's something you can do if it's consistent with your values, and for most people it is, and they would do it. I don't know if there'd be more charity or less charity. I think it would be more focused charity. I think it would be more efficient charity. I think there'd be more competition around the charity. But, you know, in terms of, I also believe strongly that people would not be starving in the streets because... A, there'd be jobs, but people who couldn't take care of themselves, going back to the original question, would be taken care of through charity. But that's a, such a small number. Think about today in America, almost 50% of Americans get stuff from the government. Almost 50%. Do they all need it? You mean we all, we couldn't have saved the older, older among us. We couldn't have saved. We really need Social Security. We really need the government to take our money away from us to save it for us because we couldn't have saved. We can't. Buy health insurance? We can't take care of ourselves? I don't believe that. I believe every one of us can take care of himself. Some people will do a better job at it. Some people will do a worse job at it. But that's life. Don't penalize it. What was the second question? Um, what do you see as the role of the state? The role of the state. So I think the state, I said this early on, I think the state has only one role, and that is the protection of individual rights. Uh, individual rights meaning our freedoms of action, right? And therefore, the state should be limited to those functions that are required in order to protect individual rights, which are basically three. The police, the military, and a judicial system. And there is a role for legislation, legislation around protecting rights. So for example, helping us define property rights, particularly in new areas like, like technology and stuff like that. But it's very narrow. I don't think the legislature should meet more than once every two years for a few months. I don't think there's that much to do. Um, the more the legislature meets, the more they intervene in our lives. So I think it's a very, it's a very limited role. Yes, but they can only use force. So this is the, I mean, that's, that's crucial. The only reason the government should ever use force is in self-defense, in protecting rights. So force is fine. Somebody's running at me with a knife or with a gun. I don't say, well, you know, force is bad for the mind, so I'm not going to intervene. No, I shoot them, right, before they can shoot me. So force is justified only in self-defense, never initiated. This is why 
the whole tax system, the whole regulatory system, that's not a self-defense. That's initiated. That's telling me what I can and can't do. I haven't done anything yet. But I'm, I'm already restricted, right? I want people to be free, and then if they initiate force, then the government steps in and stops it, and puts them in jail or, or, or does what's necessary in order to penalize them. Same with foreign affairs. I don't believe in sending troops to bring democracy to the world. If somebody attacks you, though, you've got to have a military to defend yourself. So the whole point is defense. Force is only legitimate in self-defense. Um, so uh, we have had a lot of uh, talk about um, individual rights, but what have capitalism done so far uh, in terms of racism, sexism, and gender equality or discrimination? Yeah, that's great. So capitalism is the only system in human history to get rid of all those things. So at the birth of capitalism, there was slavery. There was slavery forever. You go back to the Bible, I know the, my Old Testament, God tells the Jews how to treat their slaves. Not slavery's bad. No, this is how you should treat them. You should treat them kind of nice, but you can still have slaves. When, uh, when the Jews, you know, are conquering, uh, you know, the land of Israel, God at some point tells them, you should kill every man, woman, and child of this other nation. And they come back with the children. And God's furious. I told you to kill everybody. So say, well, they're the children. It says, okay, well, kill all the boys. You can keep the girls as sex slaves. Literally in the Old Testament. Right? So slavery's always been around. The most horrific types of slavery. When did slavery go away? When did slavery go away? Where, I mean, 90% of slavery. When did it go away? What, what's the date, approximately? Slavery goes away. When does British, when does Britain ban slavery and the slave trade? About 1800, I think 1805, something like that. When does the United States ban slavery? 1863 with the Civil War, right? When does Brazil finally ban slavery? End of the 19th century. So the century in which slavery is banned is this, the most capitalist century in human history. When do women achieve the right to vote, the right to own property? And in which countries do women achieve the right to vote and to own country, property? The most capitalist countries in the world. The less capitalist, the longer it took. But it happens a little after slavery, so it happens in the early 20th century. Where? In the most capitalist countries in the world. So the opposite. What is the most diverse country? What are the most diverse countries in the world? Well, the United States, Brazil. I mean, there are few, but the United States is one of them. Brought people from all over the world. It's not like when they were home, they didn't hate other people for the way they looked. The Irish hated the... the, the, the you know, the, the Brits for good reason. You know, northern Italians hate the southern Italians who hated the, I mean, everybody, I mean, the, the racism, unfortunately, sadly, has been a feature of human life forever. It's called tribalism. My tribe, you're the other, right? When did that start going away? When we all arrived together and lived together and worked together and got to know each other and discovered that skin color and, and, and these other features are not important. That's capitalism. That's what happens under capitalism. So the opposite is true. I believe that anytime you go towards collectivism, tribalism, otherism, you get more racism, not less racism. You get more discrimination, not less discrimination. Yeah. Um. Oh, yeah. I'd like to return very briefly to the point about capitalism's imposition of desire is coercive. Because you said they don't make you want things, which might be true in the case of Starbucks, but let's say something like Tylenol versus the generic, right? Um, they, one product advertises and thus instills in you a desire to buy it in a way that classical economic theory says a rational actor shouldn't. And if you said before the example with the gun, like when I put it to your head, you no longer get to act rationally. You have to act by this reality of force. In the departure from rationality in that transaction, wouldn't it be coercive? No, because there's no departure from rationality. So it's still true that the responsibility is yours to engage your mind and to think about Tylenol versus the... the so yes, I've heard Tylenol. You know, uh, beer commercials. You see beer commercials, they, they've changed in recent years. Old beer commercials used to have bikini-clad women all over the thing, and everybody's drinking beer as if there's a relationship between the two. But they wanted to associate uh, beautiful women, sex, and drinking beer, Budweiser, whatever. I don't like beer. I don't drink beer because they're bikini-clad girls in advertising. 
It's stupid and it makes no sense. Now, there are people who might. I'm not saying nobody does. But whose responsibility is it? It's theirs. It's theirs. They need to think. But if you think, it takes you two seconds. If Tylenol, you can, today, you can Google Tylenol versus generic. And in two seconds, you can figure out what's better, right? And, and there's economic consequences. So it's, look, rationality is an achievement. It's a virtue. It's something you have to work at. It's something you should get moral credit for. I think it's the most important moral thing you can do. That's what we should be teaching people. So the problem with this, the same I said before, is not the advertising. Advertising gives me information. I know this Tylenol. Good. It's the fact that we don't teach people to think for themselves. That, to me, is the problem. Teach people to think for themselves. Advertising becomes less valuable, at least the bad advertising, the ones that connect bikinis with beer, right, become less valuable. And, and the advertising that is valuable gets elevated because I think advertising is crucial because I learn a lot of things that I didn't know before through advertising. I learn about products. I learn about things that are out there that I didn't know. So it's, advertising should be about providing information. And it will only be about more providing information as we demand that as consumers. And we'll demand it when we become more rational. Rationality, just like selfishness, is not automatic. You have, it's an achievement. It's something you have to work on. How are we doing? We've got a couple of questions here if you want to do them. Mine is more common based on what I've, you know, kind of heard um, in the last hour or so. It just... Uh, you know, it just it occurs to me that the politicians are actually the ones that are perpetuating this idea of not thinking, which is what you're trying to, you know, focus here and say you've got to think. Because all of these isms, sexism, racism, all of that, you know, you only embrace it when you don't think. Yes. And I was in India just, you know, a few months ago. And, you know, it was, it was such a stark contrast to me because... I went around the place quite a bit and I've heard a lot of people saying, oh, we are very poor and I can't do this, I can't do that. And I started asking them, why can't, you know, why can't you, like you talked about shampooing the hair, of course, there is no license there. I said, why can't you just go sell vegetables or, you know, flowers which people buy there? Do something, do not depend on the government and, you know, or do not keep cribbing. And it, you know, as I thought more about it, it was just the politicians in it, you know, just to make their lives better and get more votes, it seems yeah. like they're just perpetuating these crimes, if you will, in my, in my so opinion. I don't think it's the politicians. As bad as I think politicians are and as, as awful as I think they are. I think we get the politicians we deserve. I think it's the other way around. I don't think politicians lead. I think politicians are followers. I blame, you know, a force that's much more insidious than that and is right in our presence right now. I blame the intellectuals. The intellectuals are the ones who teach us. They teach us whether it's because they train our teachers, whether it's because it's, they're in the media, whether it's because they're, they're professors at our universities. They're the ones who don't teach us how to think when that's their job. They're the ones who tell us to depend on government when they know they should know better. They're the ones who tell us that socialism is okay when they know history. They've studied history. Most of us have not. Well, what do we know? Most people out there don't know stuff, right? But who does? Well, Paul Krugman knows, and that, I won't call him the names I'd like to, he perpetuates lies. Lies he knows better. And, and indeed, with Paul Krugman, you can take his economics textbook from 20 years ago, and then his New York columns, and you can see how he's changed. He used to be an economist. Now he's just a hack. And worse. So that's who perpetuates this. It's the intellectuals. It's your professors telling you there's no knowledge, that it's all subjective, that, uh, you know, the, the, whether it's postmodernism or whether it's uh, the, the analysts. So it's your philosophy professors. It's your politics professors who don't teach you this. The most important event in all of human history. Look at the difference. And yet they don't teach you this. Or this little blimp up and why Greece was successful. No. Instead... They, they, they teach you ideas that are consistent with this. That, to me, 
the economists, the, 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 the political scientists, the philosophers, they're the ones to blame. The politicians are, you know, the end result of a horrible intellectual system. The most important people in the world are intellectuals. And among the intellectuals, the most important are university professors. And if the world is going to hell, that's where you should look. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. You couldn't have communism without intellectuals buying into communism. You couldn't have had fascism without intellectuals in Germany advocating for the ideas that led to Hitler. That's, you have to look at the universities to, to see where the real rot is, intellectual rot. Uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, investing stuff lately, and, and to kind of meander around this stuff, I keep coming across instances where they say that stability is destabilizing, that the, the, the a consistent presence of like, like an artificial safety perhaps induced by the Federal Reserve or by whoever, by, 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 by driving out the normal variation you actually encourage massive crashes. And the inverse of that is that instability is stabilizing. Absolutely. So when I look at your curve, instability was that dramatic transformation Absolutely. in lifestyles, and instability created our political stability. And now we've had this. No, so, so is, in, is that any part of this? So stability thing? gives you 1% to 2% growth of the economy instead of 5, 6, 7, 8% growth in the economy when poor people would actually rise up because there's so many jobs and so many things to do that, that they would actually rise up to middle class. And stability gives you what we have today in America, what we have in Japan, what we have in Europe, which is basically nothing. Slight, slow economic bo growth, boring, although the stock market's been a little interesting the last few days. Um, but no, uh, Schumpeter, the great uh, uh, economist, called, uh, called it the, the forces of creative destruction. You need it. You need once in a while to flush out the system of the, of the, of the stuff that doesn't work anymore. That's no good. Uh, you know, s s somebody has to shut down typewriter companies when you have word coming out. Somebody has to shut down the buggy whip industry when you get automobiles. That has to happen. We, you know, we, we're now it's very fashionable to condemn private equity. Even Tucker Carlson goes out of his way to go after private equity. But private equity is exactly that function in finance that shuts down the bad industries that are not doing any good anymore and optimizes and allocates capital in an optimal way. So what you want is, is a dynamism, which I think, so take the Federal Reserve, right? The Federal Reserve was created in 1914, established in 1914, in order to smooth out economic success. So we, 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 there was too much instability in the 19th century, too much ups and downs. And what have we had since uh, the establishment of the Federal Reserve? Less than 20 years later, we get a Great Depression, completely acknowledged by economists, caused by the Federal Reserve. Great Depression. I mean, no depression in American history is as bad as the Great Depression. When we didn't have a Federal Reserve, we did better. Then, okay, we had some periods, we had a war, and we had, we had some periods of good economic growth. And then because of the Fed, Nobody disputes this because of the Fed. We had hyperinflation in the 70s with stagflation, stagnation and inflation. And then if you look at the financial crisis we just had, economists in five, 10 years will identify the fact that it was caused to a large extent by the Federal Reserve. All the Federal Reserve has done is created instability, massive crashes, a, a, a sense of, you know, uh, uh, of progress and smoothness and everything. And then bam, everything falls out from under your feet. It's going to happen now whether now or in five years or sometime it's going to happen. You can't have these low interest rates without paying a price, and the price is going to be big when it happens. So, yes, I agree completely. The attempt of government to, 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 to reduce risk actually increases existential risk. It makes the risk much more, much bigger. And it hurts the people who can least afford to be hurt. Because, again, I think the poor are the ones who suffer the most from government intervention. They're the real victims. Again, I can handle more taxes. They can't handle me paying more taxes. Because me paying more taxes hurts them. All right, so we'll get to you, but maybe somebody who hasn't asked here. And then uh, maybe we'll take her question and we'll call it a night because everybody's leaving. So thank you very much for a great talk. Um, I had kind of a two-part question. One, I uh, was really interested by your comment where you talked about morality lagging 
behind and our goal is to, to catch up. So one, do you think something is, the, the fact that morality has not caught up, is it something innate to us as humans that prevents us from that? So that's one. And two, what are the next concrete steps? Like realistically, what can we do to, to close the gap? Yeah. So why is it lagging? It's lagging because of the dominant role of the dominant role of religion and in particular Christianity has had over the world. Uh, and you know, there's nothing that advocates for suffering and for sacrifice and for altruism more than the Christian religion in my view. So it's the dominance of religion that has held it back. So while if you look at this period of the Enlightenment, they release from religion every aspect of human life, like science, no religion, politics, no religion, like separation of church and state, um, family relations, no, you know, religion, religion is something you do, you do at home, right? You don't bring it into the public sphere, except in morality, because that is so important. And it, the perception is you have to have somebody dictating that morality from above, because otherwise we'd all be animals. We'd all just killing slot. So it's understandable why it lags, partially because of the world religion this way. But there's another feature, and Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand said she could have never developed her full theory of morality and full theory philosophically without first seeing the Industrial Revolution. Because she says what the Industrial Revolution showed her is that when you free, what you could see in concrete terms is A, when you free people up, they don't behave like animals. Because they were free then, and they built and created also, the role of the mind in human life. You don't see it much here. There's not a lot of thinking going on. You're just working. Suddenly, you free up the mind. Look what happened. So you had to have certain existential... So philosophy, like every science, is an inductive science. You learn from observation and integration. You had to see, in a sense, what human beings are capable of in order to create to articulate a morality that reflects that. So it had to happen post-industrial revolution. Why is it now hard? It's hard because unfortunately the enemies of the Enlightenment um, were very powerful and they started very early. So the enemies of the Enlightenment begin with Rousseau and Kant. Begin right at the beginning of the 19th century, late 18th century. Right at, as, and they kill the Enlightenment. And from then on our intellectual life has been dominated by enemies of the Enlightenment. Enemies of reason and enemies of individualism. And they have so skewed, I said, intellectuals matter. They have completely dominated the intellectual life of the last 200 years. So while religion has faded, the people who entered the space were not pro-reason, pro-science, pro-individualism. They were pro, uh, you know, uh, uh, a secular form of mysticism, if you will. Reason is not connected to reality. Uh, you know, morality comes from, not from God, but it comes from categorical imperatives in your mind. You just know what's good. Really? I know a lot of people who don't know. Um, so, you know, you got a bad intellectual. What does it take? It takes replacing, which is hard. It's really, really, really hard to capture the intellectual high ground. And it's going to take a long time. And what can you do? There's only one thing we can do to speak. You got to talk. You got to stand up. You got to say, I disagree. I, that's not how I live my life. Here are the principles in which I live my life. And be happy. Be successful. And then have people come to you and say, how do you, how, how do, you do that? They say, here's some principles. Here's some ideas. So that's the best thing you can do is just live the best life that you can and articulate to the world how and why you do it. Because it's all about education and, and getting people to read and, and refer them to Battle Shrugged and Fountainhead and let them read Ayn Rand. I mean, I still think among libertarians, I, the, one of the big problems among libertarians is Ayn Rand is underappreciated. And the more libertarians realize that they will never be successful, never be successful, unless they promote Ayn Rand to a proper role as the philosopher of the free market, the philosopher of capitalism. It doesn't matter what Mises did, doesn't matter what Hayek did, doesn't matter what any of these guys did. Philosophy drives the world, not economics. So you've got to get the morality down. Economics will flow from it, not the other way.